So as I said, we are going to start looking at uh, the Roman of secret sites kind of through the lens of um, looking at them chronologically in secrets. And so if we talk about Peter the Great, uh, we have to mention this uh, really interesting site uh, that not a lot of people get to see when they visit St. Petersburg, which is a shame. Uh, it's a really interesting place to see. And um, this is called Peter the Great's Little House, basically. And um, when we think about St. Petersburg, when we think about the Russian royal family, we often think about giant palaces and luxury. Um, and Peter the Great, he really was different from the rest of Russian royals. He was not afraid of sometimes really minimalistic conditions. He was not afraid of um, just, you know, he wanted things to happen quickly. He wanted to, um, he didn't want to wait for a palace to be constructed so he could move in somewhere. And so, um, as you know, St. Petersburg basically didn't exist before, St. before Peter. He decided to found our city on the territory which he thought would work perfectly since it would give us Russia access to the Baltic Sea, right? And um, originally that was Swedish land. Swedish tribes were basically occupying that land. So there were no, um, really no buildings here. And he decided after we took the Swedish land, he decided that we were going to now build houses here. We're going to live here now. And um, so um, his house, his original house was pretty small, right? And so what you see in front of you right now actually is not his house either. <laughs> um, this is the case that is built around his house. And the first house of Peter the Great uh, in our city is located inside of that building. Uh, if you go in there, basically you would be inside and what will you would see um, is this wooden hut that was constructed for Peter basically really, really quickly on the go as the city was being constructed just so he could live here in his new city and um, take care of everything. Um, there are a couple really interesting details that we can see just from the outside of this little hut alone. <clears throat> so um, if you look closely kind of towards the right, you can see that it's painted a little bit. There are little white lines. And so these white lines are the remains of the original paint that was covering the house. And it was basically painted to imitate bricks, right? You can kind of see the remains of that over here. And that is because Peter originally, he wanted our city to be a city where everything is made of stone. Um, he invited everybody, like all of the craftsmen that were known for constructed, constructing things of stone. He said, you all have to come to St. Petersburg. You all have to start building things here. That was one big law that he issued. And another one was uh, he wanted everybody who was entering St. Petersburg to bring with them a big stone because we really needed stones for the construction of the city. Uh, but his house had to be constructed really fast and he believed that he would be kind of the exception from the rule. You know, his first house, okay, let's just make it of wood just so I have a place to live. But even then, um, they all painted it so it looked like it was made of bricks. Um, and another interesting detail is just the windows. In the 18th century, it was really common to make windows like this. As you can see, there are many little pieces of glass there because glass in the 18th century was expensive. And if a window got broken, it would be way too expensive to replace a whole big window, right? It, it, would, it was much cheaper to replace a little square of glass if that broke. And it was really common for the 18th century. I'll show you uh, a couple more 18th century buildings today and you will see the same thing in the windows there. And the idea of this Peter the Great's house, it functions as a museum and people who go in there, they go inside that case um, that I just showed you, right? Inside this case right here. And inside the case, they walk around Peter's house. They cannot actually go inside. What you can do there is just peek through the windows 
and look at what's there. And I have a picture of just one of the rooms here, just so you can see um, just what his life was like. Again, it's so simple. If you think of uh, the palaces that you have seen with me on my tours, the Hermitage, the Sama palaces, this is nothing like this. This is a really, really simple interior. Um, the dishes on the table are also really simple. Again, Peter the Great, he was a relatively, he was a modest person. <laughs> he liked simplicity. And some historians believe that he also had a fear of big spaces. Um, he definitely had a traumatic childhood. He saw his own father being killed when he was little. Yeah, because his father was attacked. Um, and some people believe that he would have just outbursts of anger every once in a while. And somehow smaller spaces really calmed him down. Maybe it was also because smaller spaces are warmer. <laughs> there are multiple reasons to prefer smaller spaces, but this is a fact. This, uh, these are the kind of spaces that Peter preferred for living. And he was a really tall person. He was 6.6 .6 feet tall. And the building itself, the house, is pretty short. Um, so whenever he went through the doorways, he actually had to bend over to fit in there. And um, the majority of the people kind of had to do the same. They had to bend over and Peter would joke that we just everybody would just automatically have to bow as they came in. So this and another cool thing about this house that you can see is the decor of this door right here, right? Um, it was painted to imitate a palace wall. So um, there are little elements of luxury in here for sure. So the majority of it is really simple. So in this house, Peter already lived with his second wife. Um, you might have heard some of that love story from me before. Um, his second wife's name was Catherine. Um, not to be confused with Catherine the Great, right? Um, this was Catherine the First. And she was from Sweden. As you remember, we had a war with Sweden. Um, and she came to Russia as a prisoner of war. And Peter the Great's best friend, who we will talk a little bit more about in just a little bit, his best friend actually introduced them. And um, there are many things that Peter loved about his second wife. Uh, and among those were, were also her love of simplicity. She led a really simple life in Sweden. She was a laundress there. And, um, you know, in different people's memoirs, they would mention that um, she would darn his socks for him, for example. She could do his laundry. Um, and when he had his outbursts of anger, she would be the only person who could calm him down. She had this, she knew the secret massage technique, was head massage. So he would put his head on her lap and she would just massage him until he went to sleep. And then she would sit and not move while he was sleeping. So it definitely worked out for them. And so they lived in this house together. It's a pretty small house, but they did live in there together. And um, you'd, I'd say that this is among the secrets um, of Peter the Great, right? Because in the 18th century, it was, uh, the church did not allow people to get divorced and get married the second time. Yet Peter did have a second wife. And um, the way he made it work is quite interesting and quite sly, I'd say. So um, the church would not recognize their marriage. And uh, what he ended up doing is he sent his first wife to a nunnery and said that now, you know, she left him voluntarily um, to become a nun. So now he could get married and they did get married. But um, Peter and his first wife, who was a nun, they had a, a son. And there's actually quite a famous story. Definitely all Russian people know that story of Peter the Great and his son. Um, this is a famous painting um, that you can find in the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. And it's called uh, Peter the Great Interrogating His Son. Uh, it is quite an interesting story. Peter the Great's son's name was uh, Prince Alexis. And um, originally, 
people, uh, Peter had really high hopes for his son. He wanted his son to inherit the throne. He wanted his son to follow the same political guidelines that he started. And um, he also wanted his son to marry a certain lady that would really help Russia politically. But Prince Alexis did not like any of these things. He did not really want to rule the country. He didn't feel like he was fit for that. He also didn't really agree with all of his father's political decisions. So it's doubtful that he would continue doing the same things as his father, even if he did inherit the throne. And finally, he actually was in love with somebody who um, was not the person his father wanted him to marry. So actually, Prince Alexis kind of got involved he didn't start it but he got involved in a political plot against peter against his own father uh people who were plotting against peter involved his son and were trying to um you know have a plot against peter but peter found out about it and so what you can see here in um in this painting is peter interrogating his own son the story did not end well um all of the participants of the plot were executed, including Peter's son. So he did not even have mercy for his own son. Uh, Prince Alexis right now is buried in Peter and Paul's cathedral, same as all the other members of the Romanov family, but not in the same room. Uh, he kind of is buried separately, which is crazy. Anyway, um, this painting was actually inspired by the next site that I want to show you. The artist who painted it, whose name was Nikolai Gay, he um, had heard of the story and when he came into this building, <laughs> uh, this is when it came, all came to him. He, when he saw this room, he thought, yes, this, is, this looks exactly like where this would happen. And so what, what, what building is this? This is actually a summer palace of Peter the Great. Um, called Mont Plaisir. Mont Plaisir is located in Peterhof. So those of you who know the suburban palaces of the Russian Tsars, I do have a tour of the suburban palaces. So this uh, Mont Plaisir palace is located here in Peterhof. Um, and it was built really quickly uh, in the beginning of the 18th century during Peter the Great's rule. Um, kind of for two functions. Number one, to receive guests before the main Grand Peterhof Palace was constructed. And then number two, uh, for him to actually live in during the summer. And so this, uh, this was perfect for Peter. Um, there are a lot of really interesting historic details here from the 18th century that got preserved. For example, um, even the pavement uh, right in front of the palace, this 18th century pavement, the way that these stones worked, they are triangular in shape and they are put in the ground with their angles down. Um, and so they actually, it's a really durable way of, you know, making the pavement because it exists here since the 18th century, which is amazing. And so what we are looking into right now is that grand hall where Nikolai Gay was when you know, the painting came to him, this very room. And here is a picture of the actual room. This was a reception hall. Um, so yeah, it's, it's amazing. Peter the Great received guests here. Um, he, his huge dream was to be able to have foreign delegations come to Peterhof by ship. And um, he had a really exact vision in his mind how he would do it. And so on the other side of Mont Plaisir Palace is the Baltic Sea. And again, some of the people who lived at that time of Peter, they wrote in their memoirs how Peter just couldn't wait till uh, the first British ship came. He was standing outside of his palace and when he saw that ship come, he was just ecstatic. And uh, you know, he immediately invited everyone into his palace where they were treated to a lot of food and of course, a lot of alcohol. Peter the Great had amazing stamina for drinking. He could drink way, way more than everyone else. And he definitely used it to his benefit. Um, for example, if you look deeper into the room, in the middle of the table, uh, you can see 
this beautiful goblet. I'm actually going to really quickly look up a better uh, picture of it. Um, this is a really famous goblet. <laughs> um, you can see it here. This was basically like a punishment tool at the time of Peter the Great. Here you can see uh, one of them. Um, so during the receptions at the palaces during Peter the Great's rule, um, there were certain rules, like you have to eat with a knife and fork, you can't spit on the ground, or you can't swear. A lot of new things that Peter introduced into the Russian court life. And if people broke the rules, they would have to drink this whole goblet. And you can see the scale of it. It's really big compared to everything else. This whole goblet filled with vodka. Imagine drinking this whole goblet of vodka. You know, most people pass out. And they did uh, during those receptions with Peter the Great. Um, and this is just kind of like how celebrations went. And um, there are um, galleries that are attached to the palace. You can see them over here and over, over there. And those galleries were normally used for the guests to stay in. And another thing that the memoirs mentioned is in the morning when everybody was really hungover from drinking all this vodka, Peter the Great would be the first person up and he would actually um, wake up the people and have them go out and start working in the garden uh, because the Peterhof Park was still being uh, arranged a lot of these beautiful things were still being created. And um, yeah, uh, the people, the guests who were just celebrating with Peter the night before got to work in the garden the next day. Uh, and yeah, here it is, uh, Mont Plaisir Palace. Uh, but going back into, um, going back into the city and just talking just a teeny bit more about Peter the Great, um, I want to show you, um, for, this, for the contrast, for the scale, another palace that was constructed at exactly the same time, not for a member of the royal family. And you can see how much bigger this palace is. This palace right here is called the Menshikov Palace, and it belonged to Prince Alexander Menshikov, who was Peter the Great's best friend. Yes, he is the person who introduced his second wife to him. Um, and he was the governor of St. Petersburg during the time of Peter's rule. The, uh, this palace is located on an island um, close to downtown St. Petersburg. Um, if you want to look for downtown, it'd be that way. And uh, there was nothing on this island originally. Um, but um, Peter asked his friend Alexander Menshikov to correct that and to build up the island to add a couple beautiful sites to it. And Alexander Menshikov did just that, except for he built up the island with his own palace. So that it takes a huge part of the island. And when Peter the Great found out about it, he had one of his usual outbursts of anger. So he actually beat up Alexander Menshikov with his cane, but they still remained good friends. And uh, he and Alexander Menshikov lived in this palace for some more time until it was 1725, the year when Peter the Great died. Peter the Great actually died a pretty heroic death. Um, there was a flood in St. Petersburg. This is one natural disaster that we used to have. Um, there was a flood in the city, and it was in the month of November, which is a pretty cold month. And Peter the Great went outside, and he was actually trying to save people who were in the middle of all of this water. And there were fishermen who were stuck on the boat, and he tried to save them, and he got sick. He got pneumonia, and he died of pneumonia really soon after. And it turned out that Alexander Menshikov, who was in Peter's favor this whole time, was not liked as much but by all the other aristocratic families. And really soon, Alexander Menshikov was kind of pushed away. And eventually, he got exiled to Siberia. He spent the rest of his life together with his family in Siberia. Uh, and this building here was turned into a cadet school for boys. 
Now it's a museum, so you can actually go inside and it's owned by the Hermitage and they call it the Museum of 18th Century Interior and 18th Century Culture. And this is an interior from this palace that they want to show you. This is a bedroom. Um, I think that this interior is just so unique. Nowhere in St. Petersburg can you see anything like that. And what is this exactly? Uh, what is so unique about it? Well, in the early 18th century, one thing that was really popular in Russia, especially in the capital, St. Petersburg, was Dutch tiles. Peter the Great, as you might know, spent a lot of time in Holland. Um, he learned a lot about Dutch culture and he brought a lot of the Delft tiles in, into Russia. Of course, Delft tiles were really expensive. And when it came to decorating one's house, they used Delft tiles maybe to decorate the heater, right? Or maybe to decorate a part of the wall. But in this bedroom, everything is, everything is just covered with these Delft tiles, which is incredible. Um, and that's, that's what makes it so unique. When you do come to St. Petersburg and you have time, if you have more than three days, which, uh, in three days, you probably wouldn't want to see this, but if you have more than three days, I highly recommend going inside Menshikov Palace. Uh, it has really unique interiors that are unlike uh, all the other royal palaces in our city. So here it is, Menshikov Palace. So what, what's, what's the next story of the Romanov family? What were the generations after Peter? So Peter and his wife, Catherine the First, had a daughter whose name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth ruled not right after his, her parents, but eventually, soon after. She ruled our country for 10 years. And Elizabeth did not have kids, at least no legitimate kids. Um, the reason for that was because she, she didn't get married as the church still did not recognize the marriage of Peter and his second wife, for the same reason I told you earlier, the divorce, uh, the no divorce uh, thing. So the courts of other European royal dynasties, they just didn't want to, you know, get connected with Elizabeth. They didn't want to marry a possibly illegitimate daughter. So she never got married, but she had a nephew. Her nephew's name was Peter the Third, and Peter the Third was the one who did get married. The person who Peter the Third married was probably the most famous member of the Romanov family. It was uh, Catherine the Great, of course. She was a German princess. Um, she came to marry into the Russian royal family, and uh, her husband was not alive for much longer after that. Once her husband inherited the throne, people in the country realized that um, some of his ideas were not going to work for the country well. For example, Russia had been having a war with Prussia for years, and Peter stopped that war because he was a fan of Russia. And he was not really nice to some of his courtiers. He wanted to eliminate the royal guards. And what ended up happening is basically the royal guards were the ones who overthrew him. They were on his wife's side. So he got overthrown and Catherine the Great, she became the ruler of Russia. And um, going uh, in, back into the city, into some of my most favorite panoramic views, of course, when we talk about Catherine the Great, um, we mention the Hermitage Museum, right? The Winter Palace and the beautiful art collection um, that Catherine started. She was really the first Romanov who started collecting art seriously. But adjacent to the Hermitage Museum is this little street over here. Uh, this street is called the Millionaire's Street. And the Millionaire Street um, was the place where, at least at some point, the richest people of the Russian Empire lived, hence the name Millionaire Street. Of course, 
it's so expensive to live literally next door to the royal family. Uh, and some, one of the most beautiful buildings on the millionaire's street um, is called marble, the Marble Palace. I love showing the Marble Palace when I talk about the Romanovs. And this is a site that I have shown before in my Romanov secret store. The Marble Palace was a gift of Catherine the Great to her lover, which when it comes to the royal family, we don't call them lovers, we call them favorites. So it was a gift from Catherine uh, to her favorite, whose name was Count Orlov. Um, you might remember that I said the royal guards helped Catherine overthrow her husband. Well, Count Orlov was basically at the head of that whole operation. He helped Catherine overthrow her husband. And most likely, he probably was also the one who killed him. After Peter III was overthrown, he was arrested and put in a prison outside of St. Petersburg, where allegedly Catherine the Great said, you know, do what you want, but do not kill him. Just watch him, make sure he doesn't break out, but do not kill him. I want him to stay alive. I do not intend for him to die. And then one day she receives a letter from Count Orlov stating that um, there was a fight. <laughs> uh, he died in a fight. Uh, you know, somehow just the fight started and so he got strangled. Sorry, we didn't mean to do this, but this is what happened. So he's dead now. Most likely she knew that this was going to happen. Probably she even asked unofficially for them to do that. Anyway, she of course graciously forgave Counter Love um, for this horrible thing that happened. And the next day, the newspapers in St. Petersburg were published announcing the death of Peter III. And in the newspapers, it didn't say that he got strangled in a fight. It actually said that he died of hemorrhoid pains which was just really meant to be super humiliating for Peter III, is what Catherine wanted to happen. Anyway, Count Orlov got this gorgeous palace right here. Um, and um, there are some exhibits in the Hermitage Museum, which are known with us as the floating exhibits, because officially they're part of the Hermitage, but every once in a while, when Count Orlov wanted them to be at his palace, he would just bring them over, and those gorgeous Hermitage exhibits would just be here at, for some time. Uh, however, the courtyard of this palace is a cool sight in and of itself. There is no good Google view of it, but I found a photo of um, the courtyard of this palace, which houses a really cool monument. Oh, by the way, a portrait of Count Orlov. <laughs> um, and the courtyard of the palace with a really cool monument. Now we would have to jump some generations ahead a little bit, but it is connected to the palace. Um, so this is a monument to the second to last Russian Tsar. His name is Alexander III, and he was the father of Nicholas II, our last Russian emperor. Really, if you've been on tours of St. Petersburg with me before, you might have seen some other monuments. And you may agree with me that this is like no other monument. <laughs> this horseman is really different. The horse is huge and bulky, and so is the horseman. You know, he's quite a big man. And Alexander III was a big man. Um, he was really tall, he was really big. There is a really, really famous story, a true story, um, that once um, Alexander III was riding on a train with his family, and uh, there was actually an attempt to assassinate the family, and um, the train was pushed off of the tracks there was a big accident and the train car where Alexander was with his family tipped over and in order to rescue his family Alexander got out and managed to lift up the whole train car maybe not the full way but enough for his whole family to get out of the train car so he was a really really strong man um and he was also a conservative man, which was really strange for the end, the end of the 20th century, where 
most of the Romanovs were already pretty liberal people. Uh, his, his own father was a liberal ruler. He wanted things to change for the better. He was even preparing a constitution. And Alexander III decided that no, none of this was going to happen. He wanted things to be really traditional. And another thing that he wanted to be traditional was the Russian language and the Russian culture. By the time he started his rule, um, Russian aristocracy was mostly just French already. Everybody spoke French, everybody read French books, uh, of course, dressed according to the French fashion. And Alexander III really felt like the Russian culture was being lost. And he decided that um, he made all of the documents, all of the official things in the country had to be written in Russian, which was new. It, at this point already, a lot of things uh, were being written in French. He said that all of the aristocrats had to speak Russian. Again, a challenging task for a lot of Russian aristocrats who at this point had forgotten Russian completely. This was more a language for servants. Um, and he started a tradition of Russian balls. Those of you who have been to my Hermitage door might have seen those pictures of uh, Russian nobility dressed in traditional Russian clothes. So that tradition was started by Alexander III as well. And this monument, the idea behind this monument was to really reflect the personality, the whole feel of Alexander III as a big, strong man, really traditional. But when this monument was created and placed in um, the city center, it was laughed at and mocked uh, because you know, again, it's really big, it's just really bulky. And people called it a hippo riding a chest of drawers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, when the Russian Revolution happened in 1917, um, on the square where one of the uprisings happened, um, basically after the revolution, they decided to move this monument away from the square. And for a long time, almost throughout the whole 20th century, nobody knew where this monument was. It was hidden somewhere um, until the end of the 20th century. It was discovered in the basement of this very palace. Uh, they decided that since we now have kind of more freedom of speech, that this monument should be taken out of the basement and put outside. So they didn't return it to the square where it originally was, where the uprising happened, but at least they placed it outside in the courtyard of the Marble Palace where not as much people could see it, but still it is possible to, um, to come and see it. Anyway, um, the royal family, uh, we talked a bit about Catherine the Great. After Catherine the Great, uh, the country was ruled by her son, um, her son Paul. And normally uh, when I talk about Paul, I show his palace. But today I want to show something a little bit different. A, a place where Emperor Paul liked to spend a lot of his time is this big park right here uh, called the Field of Mars. As you know, um, Mars is a god of war. And the field of Mars was the place where the son of Catherine the Great, whose name was Paul, um, he liked to have military drillings and parades. Um, he was a huge fan of the military and he spent a lot of the time there in the fields just training soldiers for the Royal Regiment. And the palace that I told you about is right behind it over there. You can see the spire of the palace just rising a little bit behind the field. And what is this beautiful monument that we just saw in front of the um, in front of the park? Um, this is also connected to the god of war Mars, except for this is somebody who is dressed like Mars. The actual person who the monument is to, uh, his name is Field Marshal Suvorov. Um, Suvorov was a field marshal during the rule of Catherine the Great. He played a huge role in giving Russia access to the Black Sea. And he is known for never losing a single battle. So whenever he was in battle, they always won. And that is the reason why uh, they dressed him as the God of War Mars right here. 
All right. So um, we talked a bit about Catherine the Great. We talked a little bit about her son, Paul. Paul had a lot of kids, actually, unlike, um, unlike his predecessors. And um, two of his kids became emperors. Um, his first son's name was Alexander the First. His second son's name was Nicholas the First, and both of them really played a huge role in the Russian history. Um, both ruled for quite a long time. Uh, however, it's believed that um, Paul's first son, Alexander the First, probably played a role in his father's death. Uh, Paul's politics, again, were not really accepted in the country. He also was really rude with his courtiers. Another thing that um, Paul really wanted to do was to regulate the life in the country. Um, he believed that people's everyday life should be regulated more. And so he issued laws about the kind of clothes that people would be or would not be allowed to wear, uh, the kind of etiquette that they should follow. For example, how exactly they should bow to the czar. Um, he issued a curfew, uh, for example, and people just were not, not happy with Paul's politics. And so there was a group of people who wanted to overthrow Paul, and they, again, they involved Paul's son in it. Uh, so most likely he knew that this was going to happen, and um, they didn't do anything about it. Uh, he didn't do anything about it. So once his father got overthrown, he was placed on the throne. And it's believed that for the whole duration of time that he was ruling, which was 25 years, quite a long time, uh, he always felt that guilt, that most likely his father's death was his fault. Uh, some people believe that actually at the end of his rule, Alexander didn't die. Maybe uh, he just faked his own death. He was going to Siberia on a train, and supposedly there was a train crash, and um, there was some dead body, and he was, and that dead body was buried in Saint Petersburg. But some people believe that during his this train crash, Alexander didn't die, but instead he went on to live in the woods as a hermit. Nobody knows for sure, but this legend is quite, quite interesting. He just didn't want to rule anymore, basically. I have a question in the chat. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So Paul had a lot of kids, which means he had a lot of grandkids. Uh, you saw Alexander III, right? And finally, um, it's time to talk about the last Russian emperor, Nicholas III. Oh, sorry, Nicholas II. Um, I showed you the place where our royal family lived, right? Uh, the Winter Palace right here. And same as all the generations before them, uh, they occupied uh, this palace. But one thing that the last royal family is probably really famous for around the world is their connection with the notorious Father Gregory Rasputin, right? Those, the, some people who didn't, who never even heard of um, Nicholas II himself, they all heard of Rasputin. And um, today's secret of Nicholas II's family is connected with Rasputin. I'm actually going to show you the place where Rasputin died. It is quite a mysterious place and a mysterious story. Um, yeah. It is a palace as well, but a palace that did not belong to the royal family. This palace belonged to a family that was really close to the Romanovs. Their last name was the Yusupovs. Um, the Yusupovs, who lived in this very palace, were known um, as the richest family in the Russian Empire. Uh, so they supposedly had even more money than the royal family themselves. How did they do it? Well, first of all, they had the proper entrepreneurial spirit and they um, 
owned factories producing all sorts of different things, fabrics, bricks, wine, and more. Also, the Yusupovs married well, um, often multiplying their wealth by marrying other wealthy families. And um, kind of towards the end of Russian Empire, the Yusupovs were really wealthy. The head of the Yusupov family was the governor of Moscow. However, um, one day there were big riots in Moscow. Um, anti-German riots because World War I started and people just went around crashing every building that was remotely connected to Germany. They um, attacked the German embassy, they attacked German stores and uh, it was just a huge chaos. After that, the head of the Yusupov family um, was fired <laughs> from the job of the governor of Moscow. And that started the long process of the Yusupovs becoming disconnected from the royal family. And in connection with that, uh, the Yusupovs noticed that there was this new person in the life of the royal family. And as you might guess, this person was Father Gregory Rasputin. Yusupovs, just a like a lot of other aristocratic families, just could not believe that the royal family would choose this weird illiterate man from the village in Siberia over them. So immediately they started suspecting that this man must be somehow controlling their minds. Maybe he was hypnotizing them. Maybe, you know, who knows what he was doing. Um, maybe there was some kind of cult that he involved the royal family in. No matter what, the royal family had to be freed from Rasputin. And so they started thinking about how they could do it. The thing is, uh, really few families uh, in Russia knew what was the actual reason why Rasputin was so close to the royal family. And the reason is uh, the son uh, of Nicholas II, he had hemophilia. Uh, and they believed that it was only Rasputin who could really cure him and make him feel better. So he could actually stop the bleedings, uh, ease the pain, but nobody knew about it because the whole hemophilia was actually a big secret. So it wasn't known to the people why Rasputin got so close to the royal family. That's what gave the reason for all of these hypnotizing uh, theories and uh, things like that. And, um, you know, uh, the most interesting person in the Yusupov family, whose name was Prince Fe Felix Yusupov, left amazing memoirs. They are translated into English and I highly recommend that you read them. They're just so cool. They're about life in Russia in the early 20th century. Anyway, Prince Felix Yusupov said, you know, I was just constantly hearing people complaining about Rasputin, but nobody wanted to do anything about it. So I decided that it would be me who does something about it. And he decided to kill Rasputin. It was a long plot. It was a long plan. He decided that the best way to do this is first become friends with him. So he became friends with him. Um, uh, and one day he said that his wife was feeling sick. So he invited Rasputin to this palace that you can see on your screens right now, um, where the plan was to kill him. He planned to kill him by poisoning him originally. Um, he had sweet cakes and sweet wine um, where he put poison, and as he wrote in his memoirs, enough poison to kill an elephant. What was his surprise when Rasputin came into the palace, drank the wine, ate the cakes, and was still alive? <laughs> so he couldn't understand what was going on and um, why was he still alive? Anyway, um, upstairs from the dining room where Rasputin was, um, Felix Yusupov actually had his aliases, which was three more people who were helping him with the murder. So he went upstairs and he was like, what do I do? You know, he's still alive. I don't know what to do. Uh, in fact, um, he went back downstairs. Rasputin saw a guitar 
there and gave it to Felix and said, oh my gosh, I, I heard you sing well. Can you play the guitar and sing to me? Um, and he also said, you know, it was the weirdest feeling ever. I was just trying to kill somebody and here it is, this person's still alive and I'm singing to him right now. Anyway, uh, his helpers said, okay, you know, here is a gun. You have to shoot him then if he's still alive. So he went downstairs. Um, Rasputin was actually admiring a crucifix that was in that room. And in fact, I forgot I have a picture of the room for you <laughs> so that you can really imagine the story better. Here is the crucifix. So he went downstairs. Rasputin was looking at the crucifix, was not looking at Felix. All of a sudden, Felix grabbed the gun and shot Rasputin in the back. Um, Rasputin fell and Felix was like, okay, this is done, you know. He went upstairs to his friends and so they wanted to go over the plan once more. And the plan was to tie him up. They had a car. Um, one of the members of the plot was actually a member of the royal family. So they had a car with the um, Romanov coat of arms and they knew the police would never stop that car. So they, they were like, okay, let's go over the plan once more. Once they were mentally ready, they went downstairs and um, Felix leaned over Rasputin's body, ready to tie him up. And what was his, he was so surprised when he saw that Rasputin opened his eyes and started wrestling him. So he was still alive again. <laughs> uh, after being poisoned and shot, this person was still alive. And maybe Felix was just so shocked, but somehow he lost the wrestling match with a man who was just poisoned and shot. So Rasputin managed to run away, go into the courtyard of the palace, and uh, you know they chased him and they kept shooting him. Finally, Rasputin fell and they came and they beat him more. And finally, they tied him up, they put him in the car, they went on and dropped the body in the Neva River. Oh, of course, the next day, the royal family sends for Rasputin. They can't find him, and they immediately start police search, looking for Rasputin. Uh, Rasputin's body was found um, in the water, taken out, and there was a medical expertise um, immediately. They were trying to figure out the cause of the murder, uh, the cause of death. And um, actually, the official medical expertise says that he died of being shot, but there is a legend that says that there, this was only the official expertise, and there's another one that says that his lungs were filled with water, and that means he was still alive and breathing in the water, so he actually died of drowning. Nobody knows for sure, but you could, you, you could tell this man definitely had superpowers. So all of that happened um, in, the, um, in the winter of 1917, really, really close to the Russian Revolution, which you might know happened in the end of 1917. Um, the royal family did not have much time to rule the country. Soon after that, our last royal family uh, was overthrown. And now um, the royal family could not rule the country anymore. Uh, our country now was ruled by the so-called provisional government, which was a government comprised of members of different political parties whose job was to decide, you know, what was going to happen in the country next. And the royal family themselves, they were placed under house arrest. Um, I'm going to quickly show you the place where that happened. Um, some of you might have seen it before. It's um, this gorgeous palace right here, which was actually the last family's favorite palace. It's called Catherine's Palace, and um, they were living there at the time. Um, I do show a bit more of it during my summer palaces tour, um, but this is where they were placed under house arrest. And I have some historic photos of our last royal family during house arrest. So here, for example, you can see Nicholas and his wife Alexandra just resting, resting in the park uh, next to Catherine's palace. Um, they did get a lot of outside time, outdoors time. Uh, and here's another photo. 
um, it's, it's stated in different people's memoirs that, and Nicholas's diary too, that Nicholas actually got along with the guards really well, um, and the whole family really did. And so what you can see here, this is Nicholas helping one of his guards carry around these logs. Another cool historic photo uh, that I have here is the four daughters of, the, uh, of Nicholas and Alexandra, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. And weirdly, right, they're bold here in this picture. It's because they had measles and um, they all, they shaved their heads because they lost uh, a lot of their hair. And so that also happened while they were under house arrest. Um, anyway, um, as you might know, at the end of the house arrest, unfortunately, uh, the last royal family was killed. Um, it happened already not in St. Petersburg. That was already in the region called the Urals, which is kind of an, uh, we believe that's where Europe meets Asia. So in the middle, um, in the middle of the uh, continent. And um, the bodies were thrown in the coal mines. They were not even given a proper burial. So for a long time, nobody knew what exactly happened to the royal family because uh, again, nobody knew where the bodies were buried. So there were lots of theories about what could possibly happen um, to the last royal family. They were theories that some of them survived, right? You probably heard of Anastasia survived, um, but unfortunately, None of these theories are true, and none of the members of the last royal family survived. They, um, the bodies were found in the second half of the 20th century. DNA tests were held, and it was proven that, yes, those were the members of the royal family, and um, their bodies were ultimately buried in St. Petersburg. But some distant relatives and friends of the royal family, they did survive. Remember Felix Yusupov that I told you about? Uh, where is he? Um, Felix Yusupov, um, together with, for example, the mother of the last Russian emperor, managed to escape Russia on a ship. There was a ship that left from the south of Russia uh, called Marlboro. It was sent by the British. Um, and he lived the rest of his life in France, which is where he published his memoirs about Rasputin murder. Um, other distant relatives, cousins, and so on, um, a lot of them also did manage to survive. That's why there are, there still are the descendants of the Romanov family all around the world, not just in Europe, but also in, in North America, in Asia. And uh, they do come and visit St. Petersburg, uh, visit the place where uh, their ancestors are buried. And so, yeah, the Romanov uh, family still lives on. <laughs> so we, I tried my best today to kind of take you through uh, the, the major chunk of the Romanov history, starting with Peter the Great and ending with the last royal family, especially focusing on their secret. <laughs> um, and so if you have any questions, I, I'd love to answer. Um, let me know. Uh, will the royal family ever take power ever again? Um, well, probably not. <laughs> and um, none of the things that they used to own are theirs anyway. You know, they now belong to the current government. Um, what books on the Romanovs would you recommend? So the, my favorite one um, is called The Romanovs um, by Simon Montefiore. Um, the Romanovs by Simon Montefiore. Uh, oops, I was typing in Russian this whole time. Yes, so um, this is a big book. Uh, it's definitely a long read that you might get tired of, you know, come back to. This book talks about the whole Romanov dynasty. So not just the chunk that I told you about today, but the very beginning, before St. Petersburg was even founded. 
Um, but it is quite interesting. Um, it is quite, I, I really highly recommend reading it. Uh, this is more like serious approach. Though he tries to write it at least with a little bit of like fiction touch. So it still feels like a story, but it is filled with quotes and details. Um, but it's good. I, I recommend this book. And then there are a lot of fiction books um, about them that are not all true, but some are just entertaining. Like, for example, if you are interested in the last royal family, there is a great book called The Romanov Bride by um, Robert Alexander. Um, this is just an entertaining book. There is a book called The Secret Wife. Um, now that one, like totally is not, what happens in it is not true at all, but fun. <laughs> Based on the life of Tatiana, um, one of the daughters of um, Nicholas II. Again, I, I recommend reading the memoirs by Felix Yusupov. Uh, it's really fun. It just, it's his memoirs. It, Felix Yusupov memoirs. Um, Nicholas and Alexandra. Uh, is another one and then there is a yeah i'd say these are kind of the the main ones and then if you look at the romanovs by montefiore in the end he also has a nice big list of books too will there be another tour about the romanovs um probably <laughs> i love talking about the romanovs and i'm also making videos about the romanovs i have a youtube channel um where i i kind of i i started different uh, series of videos um but there is there is a se series on the romanovs i already talked about oh sorry i'm not sharing my screen um i i made a video on peter the great a video on uh catherine the first Elizabeth, Catherine the Great, actually three videos of, on Catherine the Great. I, I, I talked a lot about her um, and then about the last czars. If you want to find my channel, it's called Eagle Travel Russia. So feel free to find us. Um, and I do talk about the royal family more in that. And yeah, I'll, I'll do another tour, of course. Was there ever a movie made about the Romanovs? Not like a Hollywood made movie. Um, um, of course, there are, well, the one that I love and um, a lot of people like, and it's like a good way to kind of consolidate the royal family in one movie is called The Russian Ark. And the Russian Ark um, was shot at the Hermitage Museum, and it's done all in one take which is really cool and it goes through different generations of the romanovs from um peter the great also and it shows like peter the great in there and it like goes through different rooms and in different rooms like the time changes and it goes through many generations and that is beautiful it's not really informative but it's beautiful um, um about uh and then there's one called the last czars now that focuses on only the last royal family that's on netflix and it's a show um and i also write like this russian show um about catherine the great um let me find it um I'm going to send you a link and this show is about Catherine the Great only, but it's awesome. And if you want to watch it, it, it has subtitles. You have to buy access to this website, but you can message me. You know how to find me on social media and I can give you my um, email and password so you can log into that if you want to just watch that show. And so that show is about Catherine the Great and it's about how she rose to power which is also i think that of all the shows that i've seen about catherine the great this one is the closest to the truth um and so that would be an 
an educational experience even. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but the biggest one is yeah, the Romanos by Montefiore. And if you want to um, just learn more about Russia in general um, and the royal family, feel free to find us on social media. I'll show, I'll show you our Facebook page. So feel free to find us on Facebook, Eagle Travel Tours to Russia. You can find us there. And again, when we make new posts about anything, the Romanovs and the royal family, new tours, it's all there. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the tour for kids. I did a tour for kids before. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, if there is demand, definitely I, I will do. I will do more of that. Um, if you want to find our, um, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, I think a lot of you uh, have already <laughs> done this, but feel free to do that. I will post this link into the chat, and then you can enter your email address here and click subscribe, um, and that will subscribe you to our newsletter and we'll send you the recording of the last free tour that I did. Um, so yeah, and if you, if you wanna leave a donation for us, you can use this PayPal link, paypal.me um, slash Olga Russia, feel free to do that. It's absolutely voluntary. Since this is a free tour, you don't have to do that, but you can if you want. And that link is in the chat as well. Um, I've kind of been repeating some of the free tours, but if there is anything that um, you feel like you want to learn about and uh, want to give me ideas for uh, what else I should base my free tours on, let me know. Again, you can always find me on social media. I, I, um, I'd love to hear questions from you. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, Yes, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I love seeing all of you again. This is, this is so great. And hello again to those of you who are new. I hope you stay in touch with us. I hope you come to more of our tours. And uh, have a great rest of your week. Bye, everyone.